Hey scholars, welcome to chapter two, where it's this week we're looking at science, matter, energy, and systems. This is kind of a review chapter for you. If you've taken chemistry, which I hope you have, before taking AP Environmental Science, then this will be a nice little review chapter for you based on scientific method as well as a lot of the chemistry stuff you guys learn in chemistry. Let's take a look at it first. We start with our core case study, which is called Carrying Out a Controlled Scientific Experiment. And this was done, uh, this is on page 28 of your textbook. Um, Herbert Borman um, and Gene Likens, which a bunch of other people helped them survey, um, the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. And what they did basically was they had two different, uh, basically, areas, and they measured kind of the water quality and different things um, about um, the habitat before, and then they went ahead and clear cut um, uh, at a different site the, uh, the forest and saw what that did to the water and nutrients. So it said they compared the loss of water and nutrients from an uncut forest with one that had been stripped and saw the, uh, basically the effects of deforestation um, in, in near a river or freshwater system, stream system. So that's what they were looking at. They did control. They had a control site, which was the uncut forest. They had an experimental site where they actually did the forestry and the clear cutting, and they compared the data between the two. That's just an example of a controlled sign of experiment. We'll get back to this case study a little bit later and, uh, and return to it a little bit later in the chapter, but that's where, that was basically the case study. You can see the pictures of the control and the experimental group. All right, so let's get into the first section today. What is science? Kind of the underlying question of it all. Um, scientists collect data and develop theories, models, laws about how nature works. So let's talk about a little bit, little bit more about this today. Um, this is kind of the, the, the search for order in nature. This is kind of what we do as scientists. We identify a problem, mostly through an observation. Then we find out what is known about the problem, ask a question to be really investigated. Then we come up with a way of investigating it, gather that data, then make some hypotheses such as, um, you know, not such as, but I should say uh, hypotheses or, or inferences, then make testable predictions, and then keep testing and making observations, and then at the end you reject or accept your hypothesis. Kind of the basic scientific method that you guys have learned about for a long time in taking science classes. Now, there's some important features of scientific process. Number one, curiosity. You're always asking the question why, which is always a good one to ask. Um, there also should be a form of skepticism. I love skeptics. That's what's great about this class that we can always kind of throw in, be that devil's advocate, and talk about you know some of those pros and cons and, and all the different viewpoints around there. Also, it's important for peer review. You always want somebody else to look over your work so there's, there, there, there's no biases going on with your study. And then reproducibility. You should always come up with a study that actually can be reproduced and retested over and over again by someone other than yourself. And always should be open to new ideas because that is what expands and explores our field in science. So this is just a, a pictorial format or a, an image of kind of how this whole thing works out. Identifying a problem, find out what's known, do some searching, some literature searching, ask a question, perform an experiment, collect data, analyze the data. If, it, if there's a pattern, it's well accepted, it becomes either a law or a theory or mostly a law if it's accepted over and over again. Proposed to a hypothesis, explain the data, hypothesize again, perform an experiment, accept the hypothesis, and then it becomes a theory if it's well tested and widely accepted hypothesis, and then again reviewing and testing again, making more predictions. So one thing that the science focus is on is Easter Island. Now, uh, maybe you are familiar with this image, the, uh, the head from, I believe it was Night at the Museum, where it's like, me want gum gum, dum dum. Well, that is the heads of Easter Island um, and there are that there are some stories behind Easter Island, um, and it's a popular environmental story that is told. Um, it is on page 31 of your textbook. If you're following along with us today, one theory is that the Polynesians that built those big, large head uh, constructions arrived about 2,900 years ago. Um, the population, I think, may have reached up to 15,000 people and that they use trees as their way of uh, mobility around the island even to get to deeper fishing spots and they made canoes out of those and transported you know, people around and also fish. Uh, and they use trees in an unstable manner which means they took too many before letting them regrow. Well, they figured that was kind of the known theory for a while. Well, eventually they had different measurement tools to go back in and actually figure out that Polynesian may have only arrived 800 years ago and only reached a population of 3,000, a lot less and a lot you know, more recent than, than past uh, theories were, were told. And they, the underlying theme as to why that whole, why that whole population kind of got you know, cleared out because of death and death was 
that maybe rats may have multiplied and eaten the seeds of the trees. Because the big question was why, you know, why, if, if they, uh, they obviously both concluded that were, yeah, the trees were used unsustainably, which means they were taken faster than they can regrow. But what caused, you know, them from regrowing? Was it that they took too many trees and there was no, none of them were more reproduced? But they think rats uh, that came over with some of those settlers also may have multiplied and eaten the seeds of the trees. So that way there weren't any trees that could be re replenished, and much is why that society kind of died out. So those are a couple of, you know, based on new measurements and new testing methods, new theories were made. So an alternative theories were made. So that's just a, a popular environmental story about unsustainable using of, of timber and, and how societies can actually go extinct from that. All right, so scientists using uh, reasoning, imagination, and creativity learn how nature works. It's important. There's two main important scientific tools we use, and most of them are just with our minds. One of them is inductive reasoning, which is where you use scientific observations and measurements to arrive at a general conclusion or hypothesis. So using kind of scientific observations, measurements, thinking, scientific uh, method, those kind of things. The second one is deductive reasoning, which is just using logic to arrive at a specific conclusion based on generalizations or premise or observations. So that's kind of like the kind of the basic knowledge, kind of your intuition, deductive reason, and inductive reasoning is more the scientific observation, measurement, uh, data collection, things like that. Scientists also use intuition, um, imagination, and in, in trying to figure out answers to questions, and also a lot of creativity, which is why I just I think I love this course as much because of those three things right there. All right, scientific theories and laws are the most important results of science. Again, the theory is a widely tested one, supported by extensive evidences by many scientists and accepted by most scientists in that particular field. A scientific law or law of nature is well-tested and widely accepted description of what we find happening over and over and over again, um, and like the law of conservation of matter, law of uh, conservation and things like that. Uh, paradigm shift, now that's the one that kind of goes back to um, the Easter Island example, where new discoveries overthrow old theories. So if we go back a few slides to this one, where one theory, because we had new measurements and testing methods, we overthrew an old theory. Um, and that would be called what we call a paradigm shift. Okay, good vocabulary word to know for our, for, for our next quiz. So the science focus on the one was the scientific consensus on global warming. This page is on page 33 of your textbook. Um, and it says, these are a couple of questions that have been asked and then, and then discussed as a global community and a global scientific community. How much uh, has the Earth's atmosphere warmed in the last 50 years? How much of this warming is due to human activity? And how much is the atmosphere likely to warm in the future? And will this overall affect climate? Well, in 1988, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which also included Al Gore and some things like that, um, uh, found out these few things. The answer, I'll read them to you if you haven't looked already on page 33. That it's very likely the lower atmosphere is getting warmer by about 0.74 degrees in the last 50 years. Um, the second question, how much this warming is due to human activity? They say it is very likely that most of it is due to human activity. Um, will this affect climate? It's very likely the Earth's mean surface temperature will increase by about 3 degrees Celsius. So those are, I mean, you know, there are, there are some, some, some government, and then this is support as a theory that has been supported by many scientists in the field. Is it a law? No, but it's a theory because the majority of the scientific community thinks it, but not everybody does. So and it hasn't been proven over and over again. That's why it isn't a law. So research results of scientists, uh, science, science can be tentative, reliable, unreliable. Um, tentative science, what we call frontier science, is really not quite a science yet. Um, hasn't been fully dealt, dove into by the scientific community. Maybe a few members branching out on it, but not everybody. Reliable science is, consists of data, hypothesis, the one you're most familiar with, theories, laws, widely accepted by scientists who are experts in their field. Then you have your unreliable science, that is research that has not really undergone a lot of peer review. So as I might do a study, if no one else looks at it as a scientific community or evaluates it, then it really be, isn't really that significant. It's not really as reliable as reliable science would be. So those are a couple of different uh, results of science. So environmental science has some limitations though. Uh, and some of the limitations, uh, again, um, where, where we have hypotheses and theories and laws have high probability of being true, but not absolutely true. So not, not, there's always exceptions to the rule. Also biases, um, you know, scientific biases where one person really thinks one way, so they, they, they influence, they have in, uh, bias influence uh, into their scientific study. That can be minimized by other scientists, but it does have some limitations. Scientist, uh, so, I'm sorry, statistical methods by maybe used to estimate very large or small number uh, of population. Now, 
Again, they're statistical methods. They're not exact, but that's a little bit of limitation. Environmental phenomena involve interacting variables and complex interactions. So a lot of times, it's hard to really narrow down a variable when studying the environment because there's so many different variables that come into play. So if I'm testing, you know, precipitation, there's wind that comes into contact and uh, and, and humidity and, um, and 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 temperature, all the other things that kind of play a, a role in those interactions between species or, uh, and an ecosystem. So that's kind of another, uh, another limitation there. And also, scientific process is limited to the natural world. It um, doesn't always work for you know, all fields of science, only to really nature. Um, uh, science focus, statistics and probability, there's a difference between the two. Statistics is collecting, organizing, and interpreting numerical data, which we do a lot of in this class. And also probability, the chance that something will happen or be valid in uh, within a situation. So those are a few of the topics that we'll that we've discussed uh, and just in science overall. Most of this should be review for you, but uh, if it's not, there's a there's a there you can always go back and review all this. Next time we'll talk about what is matter in in chapter two point two. See you guys next time.